Reverend Leslie Chartier is a second career minister, speaks both geek and human, and has a passion for making the end of life be as sacred as the beginning. She lives in Albany, loves animals, and is a trained end of life doula. And she is pleased to announce, through me, she is looking forward to the end of May when she retires as the organizational change analyst for the employment department for our state of Oregon. <laughs> All of that, and she's a minister. Don't you love it? It's my pleasure to welcome Reverend Chartier with her message titled, And Still We Rise. Please welcome. They have this thing for short people up here. It's great. Okay. Ah, yes, I should be used to doing that too. <laughs> Well, I love this time of year. Stepping outside and breathing in the warmer air, the air replete with new life, the breaking open of blossoms and new growth, the promise in the way of hope for new beginnings. Reverend Jill McAllister, our friend in Corvallis, describes her experience like this. There's a thick bank of daffodils along a very busy road near where I live, she said. It is planted beside a ditch near an industrial complex. The usual scene is anything but inspiring or uplifting. And yet, once a year, this time of year, the riot of blooming daffodils changes the entire scene. And I often go just to marvel. This is a small reminder of the idea of resurrection, that new life is almost always waiting to emerge, that beauty returns, arises in devastated places. For Unitarian Universalists, the resurrection narrative is often more metaphorical than literal. Various sorts of resurrections can be emphasized. The rebirth of nature, resurrecting dreams and hopes, resurrecting dead relationships. Generally, resurrection is seen as the ultimate triumph of life over death or hope over desolation. Devastation connects to resurrection. What a profound juxtaposition between destruction and new life. Devastation connects to resurrection. Oh, like other modern religious holidays, the Christian celebration of Easter was formed on the pagan festival honoring Ostera, who is the goddess of fertility and new life. Marking the spring equinox, it's also a time of renewal and rebirth. Ernest Hemingway said, every person has two deaths, when he or she is buried in the ground and the last time someone says their name. In some ways, people can be immortal. I remember how we reacted as a country after the 9-11 attacks. Even aloof New Yorkers were working together as citizens of the US as well as the world were united in our pain and loss. It certainly followed devastation. There are stories of resurrection that came out of that tragedy, even though the sense of being united was all too brief. The last stanza of the poem, And Still I Rise, by Maya Angelou, speaks of this devastation and resurrection. Leaving behind nights of terror, and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wonderless, wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. 
Destruction and devastation are familiar companions for marginalized groups of people. Resurrection doesn't always follow for them, unfortunately. We still struggle in a world that is increasingly divided. Today is the International Transgender Day of Visibility. It occurs every March 31st, and how appropriate it coincides with Easter this year. It's a day to celebrate the lives and contributions of t trans people while also drawing attention to the poverty, discrimination, and violence that community faces. It is a marginalized community at the forefront of looking for acceptance in much of the world. We know the community are often victims of violence. Several of my friends heartbreakingly had to give up family members who can't accept who they truly are. It seems to me the devastation they feel in their community and the ability to step into new life where they can live authentically as themselves is a perfect illustration for resurrection. I think it's wonderful to talk about renewal and the resurrection stories, but we also might wanna look at Jesus, you know, Easter and all that. <laughs> we can in interact with the Christ figure in a unique way. I did my ministerial internship with a Methodist congregation in Corvallis. Believe me, it surprised me too. <laughs> <laughs> They don't particularly like to call themselves Christian, though. They prefer the term followers of Jesus. It may seem to simply be semantics, but there is a radical difference in how they live that out. The man Jesus turned society upside down. He brought those at the top of society, the religious, the men, the tax collectors, he brought them low and the women and disabled to the forefront. By seeing him as extremely human, we can bypass the whole son of God and substitutionary atonement thing. And they're problematic for many of us, <laughs> for good reasons. <laughs> Growing up in a Lutheran church, I had, of course, heard the Christian version of the death and resurrection of Jesus including the horror of crucifixion. I thought it was a singular story, growing up anyway, that Jesus, an innocent, was killed by those who feared him, then entombed, resurrected to life. But then I found out in my seminary studies that crucifixion and resurrection was much more common in the ancient world. Other religions have stories where their gods are resurrected from death. And when you think about it, you're, when your hero or teacher can overcome that mystery, which is death, it's an amazing show of power. This Jesus that my Methodists talk about is not the kind of person who wants power. In fact, his followers at the time were expecting a warrior but they got someone who be, preached peace and love. Not that he was passive, however. This Jesus got angry at the people selling favors in the church marketplace and overturned the tables. I can only imagine what he'd think about 59.99 Bibles sold by a charlatan. <laughs> Somehow I don't think it would be good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What seems salient about resurrection stories is resurrection happens after a time of darkness, devastation, or difficulty. In the Christian narrative, Jesus was beaten, stabbed, spit upon. From a sermon entitled, Resurrection is Messy, a short sermon from inside a men's prison by Nadia Boltzweber, I found this most profound perspective. Jesus came and stood among his disciples and said, peace be with you. Then he didn't try and hide the mark of the spear in his side. He didn't wear gloves to conceal his scars. Jesus came and stood among his disciples and said, peace be with you. Then he showed them his hands inside. He knew 
that he would be known by his wounds. Resurrection is not about rewriting our past or forgetting what happened, because resurrection is not reversal. Jesus still bore the marks of that pain, but the pain was not what defined him. I guess what I'm saying is I don't believe the paintings of the resurrection where Jesus is all cleaned up and shiny, like nothing bad happened. She continues, if you think that's what resurrection looks like, if you think it looks like perfection and therefore is out of reach, if you think the only sign of God bringing new life is the absence or failure and therefore you haven't, ex you haven't experienced it, you might be wrong. That's the point. Our scars and our sorrow will always be part of our story, but they will never be the conclusion of our story. Which means that even when you feel trapped by your pain, trapped in your past, trapped in your own story, like itself is a tomb, know this, there is no stone that God cannot roll away. Woo! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was known by his wounds, and to some degree, aren't we all? Many of us have endured a dark night of the soul when we weren't sure the best way forward. There are times when we feel battered and defeated, entombed, so to speak. The question then is how do we move through those times of darkness into the light of resurrection? Not every experience of demanding times turns into a resurrection. Part of it, I think, is being near death, physically or metaphorically, and then having the courage to step out of the tomb. If you spent much of your life trying to keep your head above water and deal with those demons who hold you down, you can become used to where you are. Even the next step that brings you into new life, it's hard to step away from the misery you know. But you must shove the stone away. The message of resurrection, even for those of us who don't believe Jesus was the Son of God and Savior of us all, is that hate and death are not the final word. Jesus was killed not for the religious, but by the religious. His res resurrection showed that love is what can conquer all. What it means to me is that kind of deliverance, of resurrection, of renewal, is available to all of us who push against the stone that is covering our tomb. Love is the final word. Amen and blessed be. Amen. <laughs> and we'll now have uh, Deborah Jordan on her singing bowls as meditation. <laughs> 